Well, I was hoping that you would all stay out so late that no one would show up this morning and, uh, and, I, and I could just go back to bed. I guess I'm talking into this thing. Don't really need this thing, I don't think. Okay, we have a, these are one hour classes today, right? They were, they, some of them have been an hour and 15 minutes. Okay, so I'll, I'll stand up here for the first 45 just to kill time and uh, let, you, let you all wake up. Now, the, uh, I thought um, I'd give a talk on uh, some of the aspects of uh, uh, the myth of mar- market failure myths. And you know, I keep, the you know, more and more I keep coming back to, the, uh, to recommending students read an essay by Murray Rothbard called Anatomy of the State. Uh, it's just one of my favorite Rothbard essays on, on just on libertarianism and the role of the state. It's online and it's in, it's in several of his books. I think it's in The Ethics of Liberty, if you want a hard copy and get, get that. But one of the points that Rothbard makes is that, is that no state can survive uh, unless it has some sort of ideology uh, and, and, uh, and a group of court historians who promote that ideology. And the ideology is usually some sort of glorification of the state and its minions, uh, 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 coupled with uh, an attack of the civil society, the free enterprise system, private property. Uh, that has to be demonized, and at the same time, the state and the people who comprise the state have to be uh, propped up as uh, as heroic and omniscient and caring and, and and so forth, and so. But once that falls, once that facade goes away, uh, no state can remain in power. Even a totalitarian state like the Soviet Union, Rothbard argued, you know, ultimately relies on fooling the people into thinking that freedom and independence are a bad thing, and that taxes and war and slavery uh, are, are are a good thing, and and so. Uh, and so I, I recommend that article to everybody. And, and a lot of what I've done in my research over the years has been trying to look uh, pretty closely into both sides of this myth. That's why I've written several books on Lincoln and Hamilton and things like that, because the, the, the myth of a, myths surrounding Abraham Lincoln really are the ideological cornerstone of the American state and, so, and, and why it is supposed to be sacrosanct. And so, and at the same time, there there are a lot of myths, uh, market failure myths, and, you know, too many to count. And I like I'm going to talk about, I'm going to try to fit in maybe three or four of what I consider to be some of the biggest ones uh, in the economics profession. Uh, anyway, today, uh, you know, where to start? I think in my other lecture, I mentioned something called the Nirvana fallacy. This. This is a phrase I think was coined by Harold Demsetz. In the, uh, an article in the Journal of Law and Economics in the, around 1970, Demsetz was a UCLA economist. He's a Chicago school economist, not an Austrian, but I would call him a fellow traveler uh, of the Austrians. Uh, he, knew, uh, he knew Hayek, and uh, he probably knew von Mises, too, in, in his day, because of his association with uh, the Mont Pelerin Society. Uh, that they belong to, and uh, of course, what the Nirvana fallacy is is uh, is a, a, a critique of the, sort of the mainstream way of looking at market failure, of of, of setting up this uh, utopian ideal of perfectly competitive equilibrium, and then comparing the real world to that, and complaining that the real world doesn't meet uh, the perfectionist ideal of perfect competition. And of course, nothing does. There, nothing on earth is perfect. And so, so it really has been uh, the one big straw man argument as far as I was, I'm concerned. Economists didn't always uh, accept this perfect competition model as the benchmark for competition. This only came about around the 1930s that it was it really accepted. Uh, and, and so, of course, you could find market failure everywhere if you, if you don't have homogeneous products and prices and costless entry and exit and uh, perfect information. All, all these assumptions are assumed to be uh, you know what markets are like. That's why you have people like Paul Krugman every once in a while just just perpetually criticizing everything that goes on in markets because they'll say, "Well, after all, yeah, I'm in for I'm for markets. I'm for uh, you know using capitalism." But uh, you know, and then there are all these flaws, uh, and, and, it, and it's really I think I've always thought it was really a dishonest way of going about uh, e- economic analysis as far as that's concerned because they don't use the same criterion to judge government. 
you know, Pareto optimality is used as to judge markets. And if the government if markets are not Pareto optimal, they fail. Well, why don't we use the same thing uh, when we ana analyze what government does? Is, you know, how, how Pareto optimal would government be? I mean, the failures would be many orders of magnet, uh, magnitude worse than anything that ever goes on in markets if, if you use the same standard, if economists use the same standard. And so, so that's just sort of an opening... Uh, commentary there. I think the title of Dempsey's article is Information and Efficiency, Another View. It was in the Journal of Law and Economics, 69 or 70, a long, long time ago. But it's considered to be a classic, I think, by a lot of Austrians. Uh, Israel Kirzner uh, uh, elaborates on it in his book, uh, Competition and Entrepreneurship. And so uh, uh, if you're interested in the whole area of market failure, this is one article you should read at some point, I would think. And so uh, a number of things I'm going to talk about is uh, antitrust, so-called natural monopoly, asymmetric information as a source of uh, market failure, supposedly, and if we have time, uh, path dependence, so-called path dependence. And so the, maybe I'll write these down uh, as a, a categories of alleged market failure. <coughs> Peter Klein may have spoken about path dependence a little bit, but probably in a different way than I do. But uh, take you know, antitrust, first of all. And as, as a lot of you know, I, I like to combine theory and history, which is the topic of one of Mises' books. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I was an economics major in college, and I, I got a Ph.D., and my, I was working at George Mason uh, at the time in the 80s, and... Uh, and I started doing research in this area, antitrust regulation, the economics of antitrust, and it struck me that uh, the standard story in all the books is that in America in the late 19th century, there was a merger wave that created uh, what some authors have called rampant cartelization, rampant monopolization of the American economy. And so, and, and so the markets were failing. Monopoly was propping up everywhere. And, uh, and so government rode in uh, on a white horse uh, and, and saved the day, saved the consumers from these rapacious monopolists uh, by, by enacting uh, the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. That's the standard story. It's in all the books. It's in the, any textbook uh, in microeconomics that mentions antitrust. You have some rendition of that story that the markets were failing in the, in the context of monopoly. Okay. Well, at the time, uh, you know, after being going through an undergraduate program in economics, graduate school, I'm out, uh, you know, researching and, and publishing at, at George Mason. It struck me that I had never seen any actual evidence that this was actually occurring. That you know, because uh, one thing that I did know was that this period of history was a period of price deflation. The whole post Civil War era in the United States was a period of uh, price deflation. Uh, primarily because of the uh, what is known as the second industrial revolution. There was a very rapid expansion of production. So supply is booming in the economy and it's dropping prices everywhere. And so it always seemed odd to me that the economic historians would say, oh yes, this was like for 30 years, prices went down and down and down and down, but there was also rampant monopolization. Well, that should at least cause you to to, to question this whole story about antitrust. It doesn't prove that the antitrust story is false, but it was, it was, you know, someone like me uh, smells a rat. That's pretty much what my career has been. It's been sort of smelling out rat holes uh, uh, that created by the state and its, and its apologists. And so, so in a nutshell, what I did was uh, I, I dug up the data, what data there were on production levels of the industries that were accused of being monopolies. And, uh, one, and how I got my first piece of information, I, as I had a research assistant read through the congressional record, 1889 and 1890, and just write down all the industries that were being accused of being monopolies. And this, this included lead, zinc, uh, even castor oil, matches, steel rails, all things like this. There would be some politician would stand up in the House of Representatives and 
and uh, berate the castor oil industry for being monopolistic or the match industry or something like that. So we wrote these all down. Okay, these are the these are the trusts that are being targeted by the Sherman antitrust uh, law. And so uh, then we got what data were available. There were there's a publication called Historical Statistics of the United States that had a lot of it. And uh, and one of the things we found is uh, we we got the data for. The 10 years prior to the Sherman Act, 1880 to 1890, and then 10 years after also to see what was happening. And, uh, and basically what we saw was that in the 10 years prior to the Sherman Antitrust Act, uh, real GDP in the United States increased by 24%. This was called the second industrial revolution. The, the U.S. economy was growing very rapidly and once the Civil War was over and there was free labor uh, everywhere. Uh, and uh, that helped a lot, and, and uh, the cost of the war had been pretty much, uh, you know, sunk. And so, uh, and so, but on the the industries that are accused of being monopolies, uh, they grew on average by 175 percent. So you had the economy growing pretty good, 24 percent during a decade, but the industries that were accused of being monopolies were growing at 175 percent. And, and, and so according to the mainstream definition of what a monopoly does, what does it do? It restricts output to drive up prices. Uh, it, uh, it's, it's ludicrous to think that they were doing, that they were not restricting output. And I, I've had some critics saying, well, yeah, well, it might have been 700% had they not monopolized these, these industries you know, instead, of, instead of what it was. Uh, yeah, right. You know, and, and elephants might fly out of my ears someday, too. Uh, and see, but but so they were increasing output several times faster than the economy as a whole, which was, itself was booming. And, and as I said, this was also a period of price deflation, and uh, the uh, the price level. The, what data we have, uh, the price level fell by about seven percent from 1880 to 1890. But the price of these items, the the products that were being uh, sold as being monopolistic fell even faster. Some of them uh, were like 53%, 58% uh, were falling much faster than the CPI was falling during that time. So you had uh, extraordinarily rapid growth in production. Not only that, but you had these same of these these trusts were, were inventing newer products. John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil Company uh, invented literally hundreds of new products in the, in the whole process of going about getting oil out of the ground and bringing it to market as refined kerosene and things like that. They invented Vaseline and, and all sorts of other byproducts that, uh, that came out, you know, all the chemists that, that they employed. And so not only did you have an increase in output, but you had a, a big expansion in the variety of products that were available in the markets. So you had, you had hyper competition uh, occurring here. And at the same time, you had calls for uh, the need to do something about this monopoly problem, which uh, which is very odd. And of course, uh, you know, if, on the face of it, it seems very odd, but really, it's the same old story that uh, any kind of legislation uh, normally has some sort of special interest group behind it. Congress does at times just come out with its own rules and regulations and laws, but almost always. If you want to know who benefits from legislation, look for who lobbied for it. That's a, that's a good rule of thumb. Find out who lobbied for it. If you want to know who the beneficiaries of a particular piece of special interest legislation are, that's what you do. And, of course, uh, the, the main proponents of this were the, the sour grape competitors of the big trusts who, could not, who were either unwilling or unable to drop their prices. Uh, one of the earliest ones was the Beef Trust. There was talk of the Beef Trust, where the the big four meat packers, you know, Armour and Swift and companies like that, centralized beef, uh, the, the butchering of cattle in Chicago. And Chicago, by that time, was a big uh, rail hub. And so it was all the, the butchering and the, and the dressing of the beef was all done in and around Chicago. Then there were trains that would take the, uh, the the dressed beef all over the country. So all of a sudden, the mom-and-pop monopoly butcher shop in town, which is selling beef for $5 a pound, has com- competition selling beef for $1 a pound. They didn't like that. And so they, they recruited originally a senator from Missouri named Senator Vest, as in Vest, like Tom Woods wears, you know, Vest, uh, V-E-S-T, to uh, have a commission. They had a, a, the Vest Commission in the, in, in the United States Senate, 
and to look into this problem of the declining price of beef, declining price of beef, not the not the high price of beef. That you know, you know one of my favorite uh, sayings uh, over the whole historical debate on protectionism was from John C. Calhoun, the former American vice president. Uh, he was a free trader, and on the floor of the Senate, he once said, uh, "Protectionism, protection from what?" Protection from low prices. That's what they want to protect us from, the protectionists, protect us from low prices. Well, that's exactly what was going on here. So the Vest Commission uh, uh, was, uh, was in the, the 1887, 1888. So this was a couple years before the federal law was passed. But there were state antitrust laws that were passed before that, including one in Missouri where Senator Vest was from. And so the whole problem was... Uh, was uh, centered around the, uh, the, the issue of what to do to prop up beef prices. And the similar things happened in other industries, as steel rails and so forth. They wanted a law that would do that. They didn't know that the law would do that. They wanted Congress to do something to, to, to put an end to this, all this competition. And, and so they did. They passed the Sherman Antitrust Act uh, to, to do just that. And so, so the evidence clearly contradicts the uh, the standard story that there was monopolization occurring. In fact, the antitrust law, the original antitrust law, was an attempt to to quell ant, uh, competition, to slow it down or stop competition. Although it it didn't do much in the first ten or fifteen years, they didn't have very many lawsuits that they brought in the first ten or years, ten or fifteen years. And and I published a number of articles on this. One, the original one was called The Origins of Antitrust. It was in the International Review of Law and Economics way back in 1984. And then uh, I co-authored an article with Donald Boudreaux on, uh, ant called Antitrust Before the Sherman Act. And it was in the Review of uh, Austrian Economics uh, uh, a couple of years after that. And so and that's where we documented all this. Another thing I did in this research project was... Uh, uh, you know, the, the famous muckraking journalists wrote a lot about the trusts. And and so I thought, well, let's see what, uh, right from the horse's mouth, what the muckraking journalists uh, at the New York Times were saying about the Sherman Antitrust Act. Uh, and it turns out that I found out that the New York Times was against it. They, they came out against the Sherman Antitrust Act. And, uh, well, I'll just, I won't read you the quote. I'll just paraphrase what they said. They, uh, they were originally for it. They thought, yeah, these trusts, uh, we don't trust these big companies. Uh, and it was just bigness that they didn't like. But then after observing what was going on, they switched and they became anti-antitrust. And, uh, and the reason, the, the thing that really convinced them was that Senator John Sherman, uh, you know, has put his name on the Sherman Antitrust Act. And that was June of uh, 1890. July, rather, July of 1890. And then in October of 1890, uh, Sherman was, as chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, uh, sponsored the McKinley Tariff Bill, which at the time was uh, uh, the biggest tariff increase in American history. So you have the same guy who supposedly was protecting consumer consumers from high prices in July sponsoring the biggest tariff increase in American history in October. The same thing. And so the New York Times uh, editorialists uh, observed this, and they came to the conclusion that the Sherman Act was just a, a political fig leaf designed to fool the public into thinking that the Republican Party was doing something about monopoly, while at the same time, they were the creators of monopoly. And they always had been. You know, the, the uh, protectionist tariffs was the cornerstone of the Republican Party platform of 1860. When Abe Lincoln ran for president, his campaign poster had pictures of him and here's his campaign poster. Had pictures of him and Hannibal Hamlin. Here's here's Abe Lincoln. Some devil's horns on him. <laughs> here's, here's Hannibal Hamlin, his vice president. Human nose. And, and the slogan was. Oh, yeah, he wore a top hat, didn't he? Give him a hat. Yeah. Protection for home industry. 
protection for home industry was the, the, literally the campaign poster when Abe Lincoln ran for president. And so the Republican Party was always the party of, uh, of the plutocracy from the very beginning and how they intended to benefit the plutocracy, their beneficiaries as politicians, was protectionist tariffs and corporate welfare funded by a national bank. They wanted that. And they did get the corporate welfare in terms of uh, the massive subsidies to the railroads. But the, the average tariff rate and during the Civil War, went up to a close to 50 percent. It was it averaged 15 percent in 1857, one five, 15 percent. But it was pushed up to 48 uh, percent during the war, and it stayed there uh, more or less until uh, 1913, when the income tax came into being. And the McKinley Tariff Bill of 1890 was just one of one of the uh, dozens of tariff increases that the Republican Party championed. And so it was no secret that the Republican Party was the champion of, of screwing over the consumer for the benefit of big business. That's what they were all about, always. And so here you have uh, Senator Sherman, who, by the way, was, was also in the Senate, on the Senate Finance Committee during the Civil War. So he's still there. You, know, you can never get rid of these guys. They're like, uh, they're like venereal disease. You know, once you got it, they're, they're it's there forever, you know, like syphilis or something, maybe politicians. And so and so he's still there and he's still raising taxes. You know, they started raising taxes, uh, tariff tax. There was no income tax at this time. And he, so so he pretty much spent his whole career uh, devoted to raising taxes as much as possible. So the New York Times concluded that this was just all a fig leaf designed to fool the public into thinking that uh, that the Republican Party is the party of the little guy and is going to protect us from the rapacious monopolists when exactly the opposite is true. And I think the New York Times got the story exactly right. I think that's exactly what was going on. And then, uh, and by the way, uh, another article of mine that was published in Economic Inquiry, uh, co-authored with Jack High, uh, was called uh, Antitrust and Competition Historically Considered. We looked at the views of economists. You know, what, what were the economists saying about this? The, the economics profession was almost unanimously opposed to antitrust regulation in 1890 as a matter of principle. They thought, they thought blocking mergers or breaking up bigger companies was inherently incompatible with the competitive process. And uh, they didn't come to embrace and start making excuses for this until the 1930s, really. And so uh, uh, the late George Stigler uh, wrote an article about this, about why economists came to accept antitrust regulation when they were all against it at the beginning. And his explanation was uh, they learned that they could make more than the minimum wage as antitrust consultants. That's what Stig Stigler said. Uh, Jack High and I argued that uh, their, their theory of competition changed from, from the sort of Austrian theory of competition as a dynamic process to perfect competition, which requires many firms. So you don't have to, you don't have to badmouth them as greedy, uh, greedy liars like Stigler did. You could just blame them for having a faulty theory of competition, uh, which caused them to change their mind. So that's, that's what I want to say about antitrust. The, and the second myth that I've, I've taken a look at is uh, the so-called natural monopoly myth. If, if those of you who've ever taken a course in microeconomics were taught that in the public utility industries like electricity, na natural gas, uh, telephone services, and so forth, uh, there were economies of scale because of the heavy fixed cost. Here's my Abe Lincoln picture. If anyone wants this, this picture of Abe Lincoln, you can feel free. I'll autograph it for you. Come and take it. So the standard story is that uh, these are industries that have economies of scale, long-run average cost. looks something like this. Outputs, price, cost. And the standard story is that, well, in some of these industries, you'll get, you'll get one company that will be the first to achieve this low, very low average cost and it will therefore be able to underprice everybody else and become a monopoly. But that's not such a bad thing because at that, um, at that level of output here, they do have a low. Oops. I guess we're not seeing the whole thing. What's that? You can zoom it out. Where's the zoom at? Let's see. The other way. Uh, it, uh, 
Let's see how Abe, Li- Abe Lincoln looks like that. He's a little smaller. Than that. <laughs> that's Lincoln and ha- Hannibal Hamlin there. Uh, in their, in their cam- that's their official campaign poster. Uh, I guess Lincoln should have a gun in his hand, too. Uh, with some bullets, a machine gun. You know, that's a kind of a machine gun. Okay. So anyway, uh, so you have this low cost per unit, uh, and the standard story is that, uh, well, w- this is a good thing if you have low cost of producing electricity and natural gas, but if you have a monopoly, they'll charge some sort of monopolistic price up here. Therefore, government should come in and create a monopoly. It should, by law, give this company a monopoly, but then regulate the price so that it's somewhere, it's somewhere in the middle here. You know, So we'll call this the fair price. Fair price. I'm not going to mess with uh, details of marginal costs and all that, but that, that's the basic idea. We want, we want monopoly because it gives us economies of scale, but we don't want uh, monopoly pricing. We want something where these companies can make enough money so that they profit and they can reinvest some of it in, in more uh, power lines and more telephone poles and things like that. That's the idea. Okay. And so, so if it weren't for government to step in and create monopoly, we would have monopoly, is the story. And uh, that always sounded kind of fishy to me, too. If it weren't, if it weren't for government creating a monopoly, we would have monopoly. Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, once again, this is a, a complete myth. It never happened like that. You know, this, after all, this is all a, a story. It's, real history didn't work out like this. Um, Here's I'm going to quote Harold Demsetz again of all people. I'm not I'm not even a student of Demsetz or anything. He he had, just happens to have uh, done a lot of research in his career on natural monopolies. And here's something he pointed out in one of his articles uh, about you know you know was it true that there was sort of this evolution toward one's big firm dominating electric power in city by city, natural gas. He said this, six electric light companies were organized in one year in 1887 in New York City. Forty-five electric light enterprises had the legal right to operate in Chicago in 1907. Prior to 1895, Duluth, Minnesota was served by five electric light companies. Scranton, Pennsylvania had four. During the latter part of the 19th century, competition was the usual situation in the gas industry. Before 1884, six competing companies were operating in New York City. Competition was common and especially persistent in the telephone industry. Baltimore, Chicago, Cleveland, Columbus, Detroit, Kansas City, Minneapolis, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and St. Louis had at least two telephone companies in 1905. And so so it, it never actually happened. We never actually saw a natural monopoly evolving on the free market uh, via this story. Uh, the government stepped in and created these monopolies, and then economists invented this theory after the fact. This theory came after, after this all happened. And he, I'll, I'll explain to you how monopoly did come into being. In the course of some of my research, uh, I ran across a book. Let's see, where is it? Uh, let me, um, you know, I was in Maryland at the time. And I ran across a book that was a history of what today is called the Baltimore Gas and Electric Company. It was called the uh, the uh, Baltimore Gas Company, Consolidated Gas Company back then, nineteenth late nineteenth century. And this this was a book published by Johns Hopkins University Press. And the reason why this is a, a relevant. Um, the, this book of all the books is that um, uh, Richard T. Ely, the, the uh, co-founder of the American Economic Association, was teaching at Johns Hopkins at the time, and he had written a whole bunch of articles on the whole electric power industry issue in magazines and academic journal articles, and so he was sort of the leading expert, academic expert of, of the day on this. And this book, uh, The Gaslight Company of Baltimore, uh, relies heavily on uh, Ely's uh, writings and research, and it was published by Johns Hopkins Press, where he, and he was probably the, uh, the reviewer of the, of the book, uh, since he was on the faculty at Johns Hopkins at the time, and, and, uh, and it's, it wasn't, the author is not Ely, it's somebody else, but here's the name George Brown, but here's what, what it said, of when monopoly did appear in these industries, here's how it happened, uh, in, and I'm quoting, in 1890, a bill was introduced into the Maryland legislature that called for an annual payment to the city from the Consolidated Gas Company 
of $10,000 a year and 3% of all dividends declared in return for the privilege of enjoying a 25-year monopoly. And so uh, this was always a form of tax collection. We'll create a monopoly, and so and since you have a monopoly, there'll be plenty of profits. We'll be able to fleece the customers pretty well. We've got a, a government-run monopoly, you know, not a private monopoly, a government-sponsored monopoly, and we will share the loot. You know, you, the company, will make monopoly profits, and of course, uh, you know, you you'll have to share some of that in terms of financing our political careers. The the, the city councils and the state politicians are saying, you know, campaign contributions, as they are euphemistically called, and uh, you'll give us $10,000 a year and 3% of your dividends you know, as, a, as a tax. You know, so it's literally as an implicit, uh, a hidden tax on the customers who are paying the bills, the electric bills there. And that is how uh, this, this got started in city after city after city in the United States. It was a, a, a sort of a share the loot scheme between local governments and, uh, and these companies. That, that did try and try and try to form cartels, but cartels always break down. And so they gave up trying to form private cartels, and they decided to, uh, to uh, get government to use the coercive powers of the state to create their monopoly for them. And it didn't happen everywhere. There was, a, there was an economist named Walter Primo. Spells, this is how he spells his name. Primo. He wrote a book called Direct Utility competition. And I can remember when I was in graduate school reading all of Primo's articles in the Review of Economics and Statistics and places like that, and he put them all into this book, and he found that historically there were several dozen cities in America that didn't go this route, that allowed direct competition in a city. And direct competition means that uh, you have a city, uh, here's, here's my map of Auburn, here's Auburn, Alabama. Direct competition means Two companies competing for everybody in Auburn. It doesn't mean company A gets the left side of Auburn and company B gets the, the, the right side of Auburn. No, they, they, competed, they competed for the whole city. Who, you know, whoever could provide the best deal, you, you hook up with them. And so uh, Primo found that uh, there were about two dozen cities in America that just didn't establish government-sponsored monopolies. They taxed, they used property taxes to fund their stuff. They didn't. They didn't use the. They didn't use property tax, and in addition, the taxation of the electric power company uh, to raise their revenue. And sure enough, what, uh, in this long series of econometric articles in the review of in Econometrica and your review of economics and statistics and places like that, he came to the conclusion that where there's competition, prices tend to be lower and service is better. And he, who would ever have thought that that would be the case? And, uh, and the same thing has been true everywhere else. The phone company, uh, the government nationalized the telephone industry during World War I. And then uh, after the war was over, it did not denationalize. It gave each state, the federal government allowed each state to set up its own monopoly with the AT&T long-distance phone service. So the AT&T monopoly was set up by an arrangement between the federal government and, and, the, state, and the governors and the legislatures of the states to create a telephone monopoly and, until it was finally broken up by companies, by technology, by companies like MCI in the 1980s. So this lasted from the 1920s to the 1980s, but it was a creature of government regulation, uh, is what it was, which as was uh, the monopoly in the airline industry. The Civil Aeronautics Board cartelized the airline industry. The Interstate Commerce Commission cartelized the trucking industry for decades. The Fed cartelized the banking industry. This is what happened in the early 20th century. The creation of the Fed was all a part of this public utility scheme way of thinking that monopoly is a good thing. We need monopoly. We need cartels as long as they're run by the government. That's essentially, you know, in Hayek's famous book, The Road to Serfdom, he makes a very big deal in chapter after chapter about the monopoly of his day, and it was nat so-called natural monopoly. That's, what, that's, that's one of the things he complains about in, in three or four chapters in The Road to Serfdom. It's not just totalitarianism and and, uh, and, and you know, Nazism and Mussolini and fascism that he writes about in The Road to Serfdom, its government-created monopoly is, a, is also a, a big threat to freedom in, in, in Friedrich Hayek's view in his famous book, The Road to Serfdom. So that, that's, uh, that's how monopoly 
you know, appeared. And so again, so that's myth number two, market failure myth number two, the myth of natural monopoly. Uh, market failure myth number three, I guess I'll mention uh, path dependence. This was a, uh, this came about, there's uh, a, an economist named Paul David, who, whose name is associated with this. He, he was at, he used to be at the University of Tennessee, I think he still is. Uh, and uh, I heard him give a talk once in, uh, uh, where he claimed that the reason why there were uh, gasoline shortages in the 1970s was not price controls, not price controls. It was the fact that some gov state governments imposed uh, even odd license plate number rationing schemes. That's, that's what created the shortages. The shortages had nothing to do with price controls. So I, and I, at the time, I thought, this guy's an economist. He doesn't know that price ceilings cause shortages. Uh, what kind of economist is that? Well, then I learned he's a Keynesian. Well, of course, of course, of course he doesn't know anything about economics. He's a Keynesian. It's a uh, you know, well-known... He, he was one of the guys that started... After Keynesianism was pretty much abandoned by the economics profession in the 1970s with, because of stagflation. It had no explanation for stagflation. And so the Keynesians started calling themselves post-Keynesians. So, so, but they said, but it meant the same thing. You know, here's, here's what a Keynesian looks like. I'll try to put something pretty good at art. Here's a Keynesian. Here's a post-Keynesian. Okay, so as you can see the difference between the two <laughs> there. But anyway, uh, the, the, uh, Paul David, uh, uh, one of his academic articles, he came up with a, uh, he, he discovered a, a new market failure that no one had uncovered yet. Uh, and so, and it, and it was, came to be labeled as path dependence. The, the idea is that there are certain technologies that uh, consu uh, consumers kind of like and they adopt as products. And, and they lock in, they, they, they said, they're said to lock in these technologies, even though there might be a superior technology out there. And, uh, and the, the, example, the example he gave was, the, the, originally was the QWERTY keyboard. Anybody recognize this, QWERTY? <coughs> that's, that's, yeah, that's the keyboard, that's the keys on your computer. And so the, the story was that uh, Davidson told was that, well, there was, a, there was another type of keyboard called the Dvorak keyboard. And it, it's, those are not the letters, that's, that's a man's name, but, but it's a, di a different configuration of, of letters on a keyboard, a typewriter keyboard at, at this time. And so uh, the story was, well, yeah, well, people, everybody adopted the IBM Selectric uh, typewriter and has this QWERTY keyboard. And uh, even though it's inferior technology to the Dvorak keyboard, and, and there are studies showing it's inferior technology to the Dvorak keyboard. And so he's saying, well, uh, and, the, and the free market often locks in inferior technologies uh, as a result. And so the government needs to regulate uh, uh, standards like this. So the, the government needs to tell us what our typewriters look like and things like that. You can't, can't allow the free market. Uh, the, I mean, the free market meaning consumers. I mean, that's, that's how this was chosen. The consumers kind of like this. It works well. We buy it and we lock it in. Okay, so, so, so called. Well, as it turns out, uh, uh, this is another myth because, uh, because it, uh, when some people start looking into it, uh, especially, uh, you know, one economist who did a real good job of this is Stan Leibowitz uh, and Steve Margolis. Uh, and there's a, there's a great book uh, that talks about this whole issue of theirs. It's, it's called uh, Winners, Losers, and Microsoft. And it's by Stan Leibowitz and Steve Margolis. And uh, what they found was that Dvorak, they, they, they looked at it well, who, where does this Dvorak keyboard come from anyway? And the, well, it comes from a, a naval officer during World War II named Dvorak, and that, that's a Czech name. He's a, a Czech American. And, uh, and Dvorak uh, invented, had a patent on this keyboard. And the research that Paul David relied on was Dvorak got like the two secretaries who worked for him in the Navy to type things with the QWERTY keyboard and his keyboard, and then he, he decided that his keyboard was better. That would be like Coca-Cola organizing a taste test between Coke and Pepsi and declaring Coke is better. 
okay, <laughs> don't buy Pepsi. Coke is better. Not only don't buy Pepsi, don't allow any, anyone else to buy Pepsi. You know, lock in Coke. And so, so, that, and so that sort of uh, destroyed the credibility of the argument there. And then uh, these guys, uh, Margolis and, uh, and Leibowitz, uh, uh, hired people to do their own studies. They, they hired people, you know, professional typists to, to do this. And they found there's really not much of a significant difference at all. And then, and of course, the economics of this is that, you know, if it's a, even if the Dvorak was a little bit better, uh, well, consumers will make that decision for themselves. If it's, if, it's a, if it's enough of an improvement and it makes your life that much better, well, people will dump the old system and, and adopt the new one. It's kind of like people who switch to Apple computers. You know, if you're convinced that it is that much of an improvement over the way you've been uh, working with your, your, your Microsoft computer, uh, you'll switch, and a lot of people switch. Uh, you know, Lou Rockwell is a huge devotee of Apple, and he loves Apple computers, and, and a lot of people have done that. Uh, but in this case, it didn't. It, there wasn't that much of a difference, so it wouldn't be worth it to dump your old computer, you know, typewriter, or computer, and spend thousands of dollars on a new qu- equipment for a you know minuscule possible benefit there. And so, and so, I, I argue also that. The real, the real path dependence that locks in inferior technologies is government. You know, think of a government. Think of patents on pharmaceuticals. You know, who knows what superior pharmaceuticals might have come into being if you didn't have a twenty-year patent on the, the medicine for this ailment, and if there had been twenty years of research and development by hundreds of companies that who, that could have created another, uh, you know, a better thing. Uh, talk, look, look at how, how, how the public schools have locked in the technology of education. I and mean, the school buses look the same as they did in the 1920s, for God's sake. The post office, look at that dinky little truck they deliver the mail in. It's the same dinky little truck that existed when I was five years old. That's really the best way to, you know, you know not at all. The, the uh, air traffic controllers, only just a couple of years ago, quit using vacuum tubes. To, to, to do the air traffic. I mean, we got rid of vacuum tubes and televisions in the 1950s. And so, uh, and so talk about it, locking in inferior technology. That's, that's where the inferior technology is locked in, is, is government. Because once, once a technology is chosen and put into place by government, it automatically puts together a, a collection of interest groups who profit from that tech, who sell that technology, profit from it, and they will become a lobbying force to make sure that no other technology competes with them. And, uh, and, so, and so it'll be very, it won't be impossible, but it'll be very difficult to switch technologies once that happens. Uh, it, you probably have read stories of how a lot of what the Pentagon buys is just grossly outdated uh, uh, Air Force jets, uh, weaponry and so forth. Why do they do that? Why do they bu- spend billions on this outdated stuff that uh, that the Chinese would laugh at? For example, is that well, there are powerful special interests who make many billions of dollars selling this, selling the government this old crap, which they have been selling them for thirty years, and um, and they like it. They kind of like making that money, and the politicians like being having their careers supported by these companies. And so that's what they do. They, they lock in the bad technology for military purposes and, and for everything else. And, and this could be a whole book topic of, uh, of a sort of, a, uh, you know, path dependence, ass backwards is, the, is sort of the title I have in mind. Because uh, it seems to me that it's all backwards. It's, it's a government that creates, the locks in bad technologies, not the free market. It's the free market that, that topples these, these things uh, it was the Microsoft Corporation that toppled IBM. IBM uh, was of the opinion that no one would be interested in personal computers at the beginning. Their business was the big giant mainframes. You know, when I was a college student and I took computer science, the computer was about half the size of this room. <laughs> and it probably did not have anywhere, it probably had one one hundred thousandth the power of this uh, iPad this kid, this guy here has on his desk at the time. And, you know, it's like... You know, it's like comparing an ant to an elephant in, with today's technology. That's what IBM thought was the future, was uh, computing on those things. And, and it really was just a step above uh, pounding on a stone tablet. <clears throat> I can remember being in graduate school and doing, uh, taking econometrics, and, uh, and you had to type in all your data on these, these cardboard cards uh, one at a time, uh, all the data, and then you had to get the cards and feed them into a card reader 
and the, you know, the thing, you know, the, the air you know, rushed them through, and they all come flipping out, and and, uh, and it was it was really kind of like stone tablet days, and and that's what IBM thought was the best possible technology, which is why Microsoft cleaned their clock, and then IBM was losing four hundred million dollars a day at one point, uh, at one, uh, right at the, right when Microsoft was at its sort of peak of uh, of, of market busting when it was really became prominent in, in, in the early 1980s. Okay, so that's uh, that's what I have to say about that myth. Uh, the final myth I want to talk about is the, uh, the myth of asymmetric information as, as a source of market failure. Let's <coughs> call it asymmetric info. And the original article here, I think, uh, was an article in the American Economic Review called "The the Lemons Problem." Lemons, as though you know, the lemon that you put in your in your uh, drink. And uh, the uh, the author was an economist named Ackerloff, Bruce Ackerloff, and uh, Harvard guys. Of course, that's where all these bad ideas come from. Ultimately, uh, either Harvard economists or their students, or or, or Princeton and MIT too. They're, they're pretty bad, but. Uh, uh, Akerlof uh, predicted that the used car market would have, would possibly just disappear. There wouldn't be no used car market. He, he, he predicted that it would just dwindle and get smaller and smaller and smaller, and maybe even just disappear. There wouldn't be a used car market at all because of the asymmetric information problem, because the, the seller of the, of the car has more information about what kind of a car it is than the buyer does. And so, therefore... Uh, people never know when they're going to be sold a lemon or not, you know, lemon being a bad product. And so uh, because of all the uncertainty involved, uh, he said uh, there's, a, there's a market failure problem here that people haven't recognized before and that uh, the sellers of products have superior information compared to the buyers of products. And it was not just the used car market. He meant this to be pretty general for markets in general, not just he just used Use cars as his as his chief example, and in, in his article, okay, and so so it's ad, that's what asymmetric you know, which means uneven information, unequal information, uh, was, and of course at the time Akerlof wrote the article, um, the free market had already solved the lemons problem with product warranties, uh, you know a product warranty eliminates the lemons problem, you know if you if you get a car. And it's a lemon, and you have a 30-day warranty. That's plenty of time to have a mechanic check out your car, drive it around, find out if it's a lemon, lemon or not. Uh, then you have companies also, you know, today you have companies like CarMax. They have a guarantee. I bought and sold several cars through CarMax. They, they, they used to have, it's been a few years now, but they used to have a seven-day, no-questions-asked guarantee. As long as you don't do what the guys in that movie Jackass do and get the car and go out and wreck it and then bring it back, uh, you know, they'll give you every penny back, no questions asked. And so that's plenty of time to have your car checked out. And so product warranties pretty much eliminated the, the risk of buying a lemon uh, out there. And, uh, and that had, they, they existed when Akerlof wrote the article, but he just sort of pretended that it, it didn't. And uh, Joseph Stiglitz, another uh, MIT-trained economist, he's written uh, hundreds of articles about on every angle of this, and uh, he sort of never mentions the fact that war product warranties can take care of these of these issues of, of buying lemons, not to mention competition. You know, if you, you know, there's competition in the used car market. So if you are a dishonest car dealer, uh, well, it's not like you can stay. In, you're not going to stay in business that long if there's competition, because people will catch on. Your your brand name will be, uh, you know, Lemon Cars. And so, uh, so no one will go and buy your Lemon Cars. They'll go and buy cars from CarMax. The, you know, the people that say. 30-day warranty on, on everything, bring it back in seven days, we'll give you every penny back, we won't ask any questions as long as you don't wreck it. Uh, yeah, so, you know, why would anyone even consider going to lemon cars if they could have alternatives like that? And so, and so this, you know, you get a Nobel Prize winner like Stiglitz who doesn't seem to understand competition at all. And, uh, you know, and that, that this, doesn't, this doesn't mean that there are never any dishonest people out there. Uh, there are. But markets penalize dishonesty if there's competition, okay, and that's how the system works. So it's not, so it's not the, quite the, the catastrophic failure that uh, that he would think. 
And think and ask yourself these, this question: as far as asymmetric information goes, and maybe I'll quote myself here. Uh, who knows more about building houses? You or home builders who do it for a living? Who knows more about supplying grocery stores with fresh meat? Ranchers and farmers, or you? Uh, who, do, who knows more about manufacturing automobiles? Uh, automotive engineers who work for automobile companies, or you, the, consus- the customer? You know, uh, who knows more about producing and marketing articles of clothing? Clothing manufacturers and distributors, or you, the shopper? You know, everything in the in the economy is 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 a. Uh, exhibits asymmetric information. The people who, who work to produce things, ought, of course, uh, know, know more about this than the people who buy them. There's another word, a better word for this than asymmetric information. It's called the division of labor. Okay? You know, what is the division of labor about? It's, you know, we all specialize in something, and we naturally know more about that something that we specialize in than people who do not specialize in that something. And we produce and sell this thing and we get money, and we buy them, and we use the money to buy things from other people who specialize in other things. And of course, they have superior information than we do about these other things because they specialize in making them. We don't. Okay, and so it's asymmetric information, if you will, which I prefer to think of as the division of labor. Uh, not only the division of labor, the division of labor and knowledge in society. That makes markets work. It's not what make, makes markets fail. It make, it's what, that's how markets work. That's why trade takes place. We have different information. And uh, Mises and Hayek un- totally understood this. I can give you a few quotes. Uh, you know, Mises called the division of labor the fundamental social phenomenon along with human cooperation. He said, uh, cooperative action is more, more productive and efficient than self-sufficient individuals because of uh, several facts, the innate inequality of all human beings with regard to their abilities in a workplace, the unequal distribution of nature-given non-human opportunities of production on the surface of the earth, and the fact that almost all production processes require some kind of teamwork so that no, no single person could accomplish them. So that's the, the international division of labor. Uh, Hayek wrote something uh, similar to this. Now, Mises was writing during the machine age, so he used division of labor. But Hayek was always, you know, the use of information in society is probably his most famous article. And so he was rock talking uh, in a lot of his career about uh, the division of knowledge in the minds of people, a lot more than labor, you know, with the, with the, the information age. He was, he was a, really a, a precursor of the thinking of the information age. And here's what he said in, uh, in one of the things in his article, famous article, The Use of Knowledge in Society. Hayek said, we need to remember only how much we have to learn in any occupation after we have completed our theoretical training, how big a part of our working life we spend learning particular jobs, and how valuable an asset in all walks of life is knowledge of people, of local conditions, and of special circumstances. The shipper who earns his living from using otherwise empty or half-filled journeys of tramp steamers or the estate agent whose whole knowledge is, is almost exclusively, exclusively one of temporary opportunities or the arbitrageur who gains from local differences of commodity prices are all performing eminently useful functions based on special knowledges special knowledge of circumstances of the fleeting moment not known to others. That's asymmetric information he's talking about. You know, and so he's saying this is what makes markets work, the, the international division of knowledge and specialization. It's not what makes markets fail, but that's what Akerlof and Stiglitz and the market failure theorists are trying to, trying to say. And, and so once again, they've got it ass backwards, to use the scientific term for, for the, the type of analysis. Okay, and, and, and of course, once again, in an article of mine that I wrote about this, uh, the final section is, is called The Real Asymmetric Information Problem. The Real Asymmetric Information Problem. And, uh, and you could probably guess where this is. Well, think about this, uh, about uh, the uh, prosecution of wars. Who has more information about what's likely to happen with Syria and Iraq right, uh, right now? You or maybe the dozen or so people in the State Department and the executive branch 
of of the of the U.S. government who are who have been uh, conniving and manipulating and lying and scheming for war for the past four or five years. You know, who who has more information about what's going to happen in foreign policy, you or the foreign policy establishment? And then ask yourself the same question about any policy: environmental policy, tax policy, spending policy, health care policy. Who knows more about that? You or the bureaucrats who are writing all the legislation and the regulation? You or the congressional staffers who are writing the laws for their bosses in Congress? Uh, of course, the answer is there's there's a massive difference in the in the amount of information there uh, that exists, and it's a different it's a whole different world than the marketplace. Okay, they, the government uses this uh, what what public choice economists call rational ignorance. To sort of to sort of snow over us to to do whatever they want because of the fact that we could never ever possibly understand what they're up to. It's not like in the market where we all just specialize with the purpose of benefiting one another. That's not what government is about. It's not about mutual mutually advantageous trade like the market. It's about one gang plundering another gang, a smaller gang. If you will, and so that's where that's once again, I think that's where the real asymmetric information problem is, is between the citizens and the government. The government has far superior information about what it is up to, and uh, and that leads uh, the, the bigger is that gap, the more tyrannical the government will be. Uh, that that, by the way, is why for centuries, uh, those of the classical liberal persuasion have always uh, advocated decentralization in terms of government because the, 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 the knowledge was always uh, that the closer government is to the people, the more likely it is you will we'll be able to find out more about what they're up to, keep an eye on them, and control them. The farther away from the people, uh, the less likely we can control them. Okay, And the farther away they are, meaning like Washington, D.C., uh, the more likely they can, there, there's a, a giant gap between what we know about what government is doing and what they're actually doing. Uh, that's one of the reasons why the Europe uh, Europe became prosperous is uh, the proliferation of dozens and dozens of city states, where if one was especially tyrannical, you could vote with your feet and move somewhere else. So decentralization of government has always been linked to this idea that it's easier to control government, but it's based. Uh, Partly on this idea that uh, that government always has an, uh, an uneven uh, advantage in terms of knowledge of what it's up to, what it's scheming to do, and uh, and the people, if they have any hope of not being victims of tyranny, have to have to discipline them in that way. Okay, it hasn't worked out too well for us though in the in this country, <laughs> as far as that goes. Okay, uh, that, that's I see my time is almost up. Although we have a couple minutes for if anybody has a question. Or a, a brilliant, brilliant declaration, or something like that. So you want to give me money? That's fine. So, okay. I, I have one question about agriculture. Uh, they have like a monitoring system, and they monitor the agriculture and all that. But I have hard time understanding if you got government intervention how people don't do inside trading. Yeah. And uh, well, I, oh. I, I could argue with that is like government intervention. They, they don't do perfect jobs, but at least they've narrowed down the like they've trading. Well, first of all, the government does not have a definition of insider trading. So this is a this is a, a classic definition of something where you know uh, traders can be thrown in prison for a, on a whim because no one knows what it is. There is no legal definition of it. Uh, there's uh, and uh, but what basically what insider trading does is uh, uh, you know. It, it quickens the time at which information that investors can use uh, get on the get on the market gets on the market and become used by everyone. So if you're an insider and you have information and you act on that information, other people will be watching you, and they will say, "Well, he's an insider; he must know what he's doing. I'm going to buy also." And so if he didn't do that, uh, uh, it would be slower. It would take more time for you to act as an investor on the market based on the information. So, so you and I sort of free ride on the, on the, inside, in the insiders and in their information if, if we're active investors. And so I think that's basically what it does is, is make the stock market work faster as far as that goes. But everybody has insider information. If you're, 
you know, if you work, uh, if you're a, uh, work inside the car industry, you have more information than I do. I don't work inside the car industry. If you work in the grape industry, you have more information about the grape crop next year than I do. I don't pay any attention to the grape crop except for when I'm drinking wine. Uh, you know. And so, yeah, everybody has insider information. And so, uh, you know, why should the government step in? Uh, the, the real problem, uh, as I see it, is that the, the type of insider information is, I don't know if you've read about this in recent years, is that the members of Congress are real bold about this now, about, about uh, uh, knowing that there is going to be a vote at 2 o'clock this afternoon on some law that will have a positive or negative effect on Industry X, and they will call their stockbroker to buy or sell stock in Industry X because they will have insider information knowing exactly what's going to happen, but you and I don't. You know, they know what the vote's going to be. The votes are all counted by the majority whip and the, and the minority whip, so they know in advance exactly what's going to happen. Uh, but you and I don't. We can only bet or guess, but they have certainty. So that, that's the real insider information problem. But uh, th there are some good articles on this. Henry Manny wrote up some good articles on insider information. And um, there have been some in the, in the uh, quarterly uh, 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 journal of Austrian economics, too, if you want to read up on it. But I think it basically makes the stock market work faster. Uh, and in fact, that, that was always one of the critiques of markets, that, well, yeah, we understand this equilibrium story, you know, when demand shifts, you go from one equilibrium to another, but it can take a long time, and there can be unemployment, and blah, blah, blah. And then when markets work faster, like this, they say, oh, insider information, we need to put these people in jail who make markets work faster now. So no matter what happens to markets, prices go up, prices go down, they work slow, they work fast. The, uh, the anti-market uh, ideologues will come up with some, some excuse to complain about markets and, uh, and freedom. It's, they don't trust us to live our lives and, uh, and buy and sell from each other without their guidance. That's, that's really what, 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 uh, uh, what it's all about. That's, that's really what totalitarianism is. Somebody who just can't stand to let other people live their lives in peace. That's what a totalitarian is. And just look at every member of Congress with the exception of Ron Paul, and you'll know what I'm talking about. Okay, I think our time is up. I have two minutes left. <laughs>